people. Um, and welcome and thank you all guests for joining us today um, for the State Library's second virtual lunch and learn. Today, we're honored to host a panel discussion about a new book called 100 Voices. I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to the book and our guest presenters, and we can start our discussion. Please feel free to add questions in the chat and our moderator, Nicole, will share them with our guests. Here's a little bit of background information about the book. In 2020, a coalition of citizens, organizers, legislators, and educators came together to commemorate the 15th and 19th amendments by establishing a new monument in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This would be a memorial dedicated to the capital city's significant African-American community and its historic struggle for the vote. The Commonwealth Monument, located on the Irvis Equality Circle on the South Lawn of Pennsylvania State Capitol grounds, features a bronze pedestal inscribed with a hundred names of change agents who pursued the power of suffrage and citizenship between 1850 and 1920. The book is a companion to the monument and tells the stories of those 100 freedom seekers, abolitionists, activists, suffragists, moralists, policemen, masons, doctors, lawyers, musicians, poets, publishers, teachers, preachers, housekeepers, janitors, and business leaders, among many others. In their committed advocacy for freedom, equality, and justice, these inspiring men and women made unique and lasting contributions to the standing and life of African Americans, and indeed the political power of all Americans with their local communities and across the country. Today, we're honored to hear from the, our panelists who were instrumental in creating this book. The first person I'd like to introduce is Mr. Caleb Jackson. Caleb Jackson Jr. is a 90-year-old native of Harrisburg who specializes in Harrisburg African-American and school district history. He is an editor of the 100 Voices book. Lenwood Sloan serves as executive director of the Pennsylvania Commonwealth Monument Project that preserves, conserves, and rededicates historic and cultural monuments throughout the state. In that capacity, he is spearheading the placement of the first monument dedicated to the 15th and 19th Amendments in the United States at Pennsylvania's Capitol. He serves as Pennsylvania Governor Wolf's appointee to the Commonwealth Capital Preservation Committee. Also, he is a board member for the African American Irish Diaspora Network, the Mid Atlantic Arts Foundation, the Lancaster Heritage Society, and the Lancaster Public Arts Program. For the past 30 years, he has collaborated with the renowned Dr. Mick Maloney, presenting programs, concerts, and masterclasses on the convergence, contributions, and conflicts of Black and Irish experiences in the United States. Their collaboration has taken the pair from New York to San Francisco, Cuba to Limerick, Ireland. Dr. Jean Thompson Corey is a professor of English and director of the Center for Public Humanities at Messiah College, which works to, which works to bring academic, civic, and cultural communities together through collaborative initiatives in humanities-based education and research. Dr. Corey's research and teaching focus on writing and the intersection of ethnicity, race, religion, and gender, service learning and pedagogy and humanities and public engagement. And finally, Dr. David Pettigrew is a professor of history and archeology span at Messiah University in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. His area of specialty is the ancient Mediterranean world. Since 2014, he has co-directed the Digital Harrisburg Initiative, a series of digital and public humanities projects related to the history of Pennsylvania State Capitol. He is one of the co-editors of the 100 Voices book. Thank you all for taking the time to teach us about this fascinating Harrisburg history. And I'd like to begin our discussion by asking a question about the background of the book. Mr. Sloan, could you tell us about the 100 Voices? Who and what are the 100 Voices and why are you celebrating them? 
Well, thank you very much for allowing us to share with the library and the audience today. So as you stated so eloquently, 2020 was the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment and the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And we were uh, exploring the crossroads of those two great events that created the franchise at the same year of a census and a national election, and unfortunately, a national pandemic. We chose as a site for the monument, the historic marker uh, from the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. It says that Frederick Douglass visited Tanner's Alley, which is now 4th and Walnut Street, uh, in 1847 to speak about the, the vote. As we explored Tanner's Alley, we discovered that it was a site on the Underground Railroad, that it was a prominent site for the promotion and the advancement of the franchise, and it was an important African-American neighborhood and enterprise zone that wrapped around the Capitol. It disappeared due to eminent domain, and we began to ask ourselves, who lived there? What? was their achievement? What was their advancement? Where are their descendants now? Do they know their own history? And so the book really rose out of the project's exploration of more than a bronze monument, but really a tribute to the endurance of the people and our incredible friends, Messiah University, and a group of scholars and humanists that we lovingly call the history detectives began to explore uh, the citizens. We could not pay tribute to the more than 1,100 citizens there. So we chose 100 that would exemplify the neighborhood. Um, my next question is for Mr. Jackson, Caleb. You had a significant role in drafting a list of the 100 men and women who would be represented on the pedestal. Deciding on these 100 individuals must have been no small feat. How did you discover these people? Yes, now, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, well, first of all, I've always studied at the State Library. So with my good friends, Kathy Hale and Ray Schott, there's a section there of the some African American research books edit, edits, well, edited by Louis Gates. And one in particular, you can go by state and city, and they will list maybe 20 or 25 famous African Americans born in that city. And then from there, there's a reference to Michael Fish. They give you a history on that person. For instance, Dr. Crampton was in that list, uh, Dr. Marshall, and some of the others that are in the book. Along with that, at the, at the uh, Historical Society of Dauphin County, where I was on the board, we have city directories from 1840 to 2020. So I started 1850 city directories. Looking at the city directories, you'll see listings of churches, uh, so societies, which is, for instance, Elks, the Elks Lives is listed. People who were involved in the Elks are listed. The uh, Secret Society, the Masonics. Also, you'll find listed starting in 1870 when African Americans, gave, uh, men gained the right to vote beyond the 15th Amendment. You start to see who was elected to city council, who was elected to school board, who was elected judge. And at that time, Harrisburg City elected officials, most of the officials were elected by ward. So the eighth ward had representation on city council and on the school board. They had their own aldermen, their own judge of election, their own tax assessors. So it was easy to copy these names down just from the city directories. And also found going through there, when you get to 1910, that's when the third class city law was changed and Harrisburg started to elect city council and school board by the city at large. And we didn't get an African-American on city council until Stan Lawson in 1960. So we, we, we saw this right from the city directories. So that's basically where it came from. 
ser searching through city directories and uh, things at the state capitol. Wonderful. Um, David, on the idea for the book, how did you all decide to convert this into a book? What were some of the challenges of deciding how you would include these hundred voices into the book? <laughs> Is David still here? Yes, let me, I did something to my Zoom here. Ah, there you are. There we go. Um, <laughs> So the 100 Voices really began as a uh, digital project. And like so many other things we were doing for the Commonwealth Monument Project, we had a strong digital component. So our work specifically grew out of uh, a, a broader thing called Digital Harrisburg. Uh, it's, a, it's a website, but also a series of um, public humanities and history projects that have a digital component, the partnership with Harrisburg University of Science and Technology, ran out of Messiah uh, University and Harrisburg University. And um, we were doing lots of uh, different things for the Commonwealth Monument Project that Lynn would mention. We were um, developing posters, uh, digital posters and web pages for the, the lost neighborhood of the old eighth ward. We were, um, you know, we were searching for uh, descendants of people of the old age where we were studying the movements of population. We were looking at City Beautiful, uh, poetry in place. Uh, my colleague, Jean Corey, was uh, working on doing these workshops with poetry. So uh, doing all this digital stuff and the, the monument itself began to take shape. It was like, this thing is actually going to happen. There's gonna be a physical monument at the end of the year. And at first, we're, we, we, you know, we, you have that question, well, is this going to happen or not? Well, it's going to happen. There's going to be a physical monument at the end of the year, and it's going to be there at, on the Capitol Park. And really, when people come and look at this monument, they may have the questions, who are these people? Who are the names? Who are the people behind the names listed on the monument? And for someone who has a, a, a deep sense of uh, Harrisburg history, they may be able to um, tell you uh, the, the stories behind these individuals. But we were concerned that the stories would get lost. And so we said, we decided at one point, Jean Corey and um, myself and uh, Katie Wingert McArdle, in conversation with the rest of the Commonwealth Monument Project, we decided, let's turn this into a book. Uh, let's see if we can do it. And we, we actually pressed the button at, one afternoon last January and said, we're gonna do this. And so we raced to, to research these 100 voices, collected information. Uh, we got over 30 students involved in the project. Uh, our little operation at Messiah came alive. We were looking at databases, looking at newspaper uh, archives. We were in correspondence with you know state library and, and state archives. And then of course with, uh, the, the rest of the history detective team, um, Caleb and uh, Linwood and a number of other people um, uh, were helping us to track down these individuals and to conduct research. And so we, we decided that we needed to do a book and we decided we need to do a physical book. And fortunately, uh, I have a colleague, a longtime colleague who runs a press out of the University of North Dakota who, uh, loves these kinds of local public history projects and agreed to work with us on the book. We printed it, we had it printed. Uh, it's available in paperback version uh, at the Midtown Scholar and the proceeds of, of that book go to support the upkeep of the monument. So please purchase your copy there. But if you don't wanna purchase a copy, uh, the great thing about the digital press is that you can download a copy for free. And so we wanted to get this out into people's hands and especially into the hands of the various descendants of these 100 um, voices. So that's a little about the project uh, of the book itself. And I should, I should note that Sharon Williams, uh, one of our other panelists has, been, has just joined us too. So let me just say a word about her. She was, um, uh, Dr. Sharon Williams is a retired educator, administrator and technologist. And uh, she's researched her own family history for 40 years. She contacted us at a, a uh, certain point in the process and said, hey, we, 
you know, this is my ancestor is among these 100 people, or we want this person, uh, or we'd like to contribute to uh, the research of my ancestor. And she was, uh, she's a co-founder of the Kindred Spirits Genealogy Workshop Group in Harrisburg. And her expertise has uh, contributed to the completion of several projects, presentations, publications, and a documentary film. So you'll hear from her in just a minute. So I'll pass it back to you, Ellen. Thank you, David. Um, I do want to ask Sharon a question if you're ready for a question, uh, Ms. Williams. Um, one of the interesting things about this collaborative project has been the active participation of descendants of the 100 Voices, people like you um, who have researched the work of your own ancestor. Who are the 100 Voices you're connected to? As a descendant, educator, and contributor to the book, what has this work meant for you? Okay, I can't unmute my video. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so uh, my ancestor is Ephraim Slaughter. And um, the uh, genealogy workshop group had uh, four members who also had ancestors in that 100 names group. So we were able to contribute quite a bit of information to this project. And we were just glad that, um, you know, our, our work, our individual work has been able to be utilized for this collective effort. Um, people know a lot about Ephraim Slaughter because the local American Legion is named for him and a uh, life size figure uh, has been um, erected to him in the uh, Civil War Museum at Reservoir Park. So, um, you know, he's, he's you know, sort of a local celebrity. He was um, the last veteran of the Civil War in Harrisburg, uh, not in Dauphin County, but in Harrisburg. And um, he passed away in the 1940s. Uh, but, you know, we're very proud of him and carrying on his legacy. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is for Jean. On research with students. According to the book's front matter, 30 Messiah students were involved in the work of this project. Can you talk about their student experience? I can talk about a few of them um, I, because actually I just spent this week uh, writing three recommendations for students who are applying to grad school and each one of them referenced uh, their work with the 100 Voices Project as really shaping their sense of mission um, of pursuing social justice through their work in grad school, which was really exciting. Um, because I think that was the beauty of the way that Linwood and Caleb has, have conceptualized this. It ties story to the important policies that, that have shaped and determined a very segregated central Pennsylvania. Um, and, um, but also the policies that have been changed because of the resistance and, and the hard work of so many of these voices that, that it was enduring. Um, I feel like such a slacker because I have like a 30 second attention span to things. And, and, and you know we have people whose lives, they died at 90 and they saw abolition and then they saw the right for African-Americans to vote and then they saw the right for women to vote and they never gave up. They never put their feet up. Um, but that was such a stunning thing for I think our students to see. And, Messiah is a predominantly white university with mostly white educators. And this was a great third space where we had lots of co-educators working with us and really informing and shaping and helping all of us see a different story, a story that we would have missed if, if we hadn't participated in that project. So, um, but it is very gratifying to hear students now, one student is working with the um, Pennsylvania, I mean, Ohio history. Um, she's serving as an America, uh, service service corps person working with um, Ohio and, and their public history programming. So, um, and she 
she cited the, the project with the hundred voices as really instrumental in her pursuing this and in, and getting this position. So um, we've been very grateful to have such a transformative experience for our students. That's great. Um, now that we've heard from everybody, I have a couple questions that anybody could answer um, or maybe all of you would have an input. Um, as you all undertook research for the project and book, what were some of the interesting or surprising discoveries about either individual members or the hundred voices? I would like to start by saying that, for, first of all, I, I have to acknowledge again, Messiah University, because one of the most exciting pieces of this project for me was the intergenerational nature of the work that resulted in the book from the youngest students at university to Caleb Jackson, now celebrating his 90th birthday, there was a spirit of collaboration of all generations, including mm -hmm. reaching out to descendants who mm -hmm. knew very little beyond the stories in their family Bibles or their family records. Uh, and so while we were discovering what they knew, they were also discovering what we what we learned about their history and their legacy. To your question, we started out with a roster of, uh, of 100 names, and we are discovering a kind of crazy quilt, a kind of connection of, of these people. The 24 of them who were Masons, the several of them who were educators, the number of uh, men who worked in uh, politics, uh, the women who uh, work in civil rights in their communities. And so the connections between the stories, the connections between the descendants, and we love people to come through the monument looking for their own descendants name, and then discover that they have cousins and uncles and other relatives. That, uh, so they're, History is knitting itself together for us, even while we are custodians of the process. Yeah. Would anybody else like to speak on that topic? Are there any surprising discoveries as you did your research? Uh, Caleb, you're on mute. Caleb, you're on mute. Mute. There, there you we go. go. I'm on now? Yep. yep. Okay. We found there are three couples that met in Harrisburg in the book and were later married. Uh, Aura Hughes and Maud Molson were on the lecture circuit in Harrisburg in the early 1870s, and they fell in love and were later married in St. Louis. Leighton Howard and Janie Blaylock Janie Blaylock's a school teacher in Harrisburg. Uh, Leighton Howard is a publisher and they fell in love and were married in Harrisburg. And unfortunately he died the same year, about four months after he was married from the Spanish flu. And then we had Robert Nelson uh, who worked as a capital worker and he married Alice Dunbar, the widow of the famous poet Dunbar. So we have romance in, in, the, in, the, in the 100 Voices among other things. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have, I have a couple of uh, uh, things that um, came to mind. If you look, if you uh, end up getting the book or downloading it, it, it has like uh, this kind of format. I don't know if you can see it, but basically we've used first person uh, to kind of give each of these names a an authoritative voice, right? We really wanted to, to give voice to their uh, contributions. And so we have first person at the top and sometimes we have this about me. So things that people said. And so for, for, for me, of course, like every single one of these individuals was uh, um, a window to an exciting world of change. And you, you, we could just get glimpses of them from these little quotes. But um, the, the kind of exciting discovery that I made when I, when I was you know, putting the 
pictures, the photos together, is the State Archives has this great collection of photographs from the old Eighth Ward. If you go to the Digital Harrisburg website, you can actually look at an interactive map, a street view a perspective from the early 20th century and look at different uh, images. So um, kudos to the State Archives for letting us use those photos. But they, they were taken right before the Old Eighth Ward came down. In some cases, they were taken after the Old Eighth Ward came down. And there are lots of pictures of people. And the point of the, of the photography doesn't seem to be about capturing the humans. It seems to be about capturing the images. I suspect it had something to do with um, anticipations of lawsuits about buildings and that kind of thing. So they systematically photographed a large part of the word, and you can catch glimpses of glimpses of individuals uh, in different parts of the word. You know, people crossing the street or sitting down. And for most for most part, these individuals are anonymous. Like we don't know who they were. But there's this there, the, the final two photos that we include in the volume. So they're at the very end. They're back to back. Um, one of them shows a pool hall. And that pool hall shows a crowd of men in front of it. Um, and when we were able to connect that to space, we were able to identify the address of that place. And that turns out to be a really important political hub and um, a hub of change in the Old Eighth Ward. And so uh, they're a group of men, they're smoking cigars, they're talking you know, outside in front, but that's, that happens to be Colonel Struthers' pool hall and I believe Colonel Struthers is the man standing in the doorway because I've seen other images of him. So suddenly these anonymous photographs become personal. These are real people, okay, right? So we can connect them. Similarly, in the last photo is um, the, uh, you know, I'll just show you this one. Uh, this is, um, you know, you probably can't see, but it's a man getting out of a carriage and he looks like a gentleman, a distinguished man. We want, and we had wondered as a group who this person was. Well, we were able to, to find out that this, that the address of the house in which he was um, disembarking from his carriage, and it's Char Dr. Charles Crampton, one of the 100 voices. And there he is, hap he happens to be getting out of his carriage at that moment. So making the connections to real faces, to real people was really uh, the historical um, gold nugget for me. And, and, and David, I wanted to add that yeah. history records these people as porters or carpenters or carriage drivers and assumes that that was the totality of their, their life. And the book shows that you may have been a, 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 a carriage driver by day, but you were the grand master of your Masonic Lodge by night, and you had status and impact and integrity and vision and were a catalyst for your community. Also, you may have been made by day, but a principal in the organization of the Bethel AME or the Wesley AME Zion Church. Uh, you may be a, a, a carriage driver by day and a band leader you know, of a coronet band uh, by night. And so we needed to lift beyond how people survived and talk about how they thrived and what was their role and their contribution to the community. Messiah the University, the History Detectives and the Commonwealth Monument Project wanted to lift these people beyond being merely anything and explore how exciting. And the book, is a storytelling book. It's not a compilation of, of obituaries. It's a, a, a vibrant and living document uh, to excite you and engage you so that you look into your own family. To use the book as a lens to look into your own family's histories and your own photographs and discover your connection. I'd just like to add on to what Limwood was saying about the, um, the stories and and uh, to also say that uh, as we were covering some of this material, um, I learned a lot about the, the wives of some of the men that were mentioned in the 100 Voices. And sometimes they were second wives, like in the case of 
uh, Colonel Struthers, who was mentioned, even after his death, his second wife kept the pool hall going. And uh, because the pool hall was such a, a social uh, gathering place, that was an important thing. And uh, in her obituary, it talks a lot about uh, her role in the community. Um, in the case of Ephraim, my great grandfather, um, he was my great grandfather by marriage. He married my great grandmother who had been widowed and had a grown son and grandchild by the time she married Ephraim. But she was in her 40s and <laughs> Ephraim was in his 90s when they married. So it was a um, transactional relationship, let's say. And uh, so part of her purpose uh, was to help to maintain his legacy. Uh, and Ephraim, who had been born a slave, came to Harrisburg uh, and uh, he, when he died, he actually owned multiple properties. And he worked as a porter in, in the hotels uh, before he retired. Um, and so everything he accumulated was through, you know, probably modest means in terms of salary, but he made good investments. And my grandmother, who was a businesswoman, uh, was able to, uh, you know, expand uh, upon what they had developed by uh, turning some of his properties into boarding houses and so forth because of, um, you know, social norms at that time, uh, Black people couldn't stay at certain places, hotels and so forth. So uh, sometimes they rented rooms uh, and that. But I, I just wanted to mention that there are quite a few women mentioned in this book. And I appreciate the fact that Caleb, when you were picking the 100 names, you made sure women were represented, uh, but then to also find underneath some of the men, there were these women who stepped forward and supported uh, the effort as well. I, I wanted to add to that. Um, actually, I wanted to add to what Linwood said about its uh, individual stories. And it's really, a, it's, it's a collective story. That's what I have been most surprised by. Um, uh, last night, I, I was at a, the film fest, Sankofa Film Festival it has been airing 1968 documentary of Harrisburg and the systemic racism that existed in 1968. And the chat on the side was all talking about um, how, why didn't we act and why haven't we figured this out? And I think what was really so impressive and we're finding that, you know, over and over again, as we look at these networks, they understood the need for solidarity and for networks of working together. Even the churches, they were always in and out of each other's churches, helping with fundraisers. And so it wasn't, it wasn't these isolated pockets. They knew they had to work together. And that's been really an amazing thing for me to see. And something I do think we have a lot to learn from that, that they understood and not just working together, but working holistically. They knew they needed economic justice. They knew they needed educational reform. So all the areas, housing, Mont Coleman's advocating for housing um, so passionately all of these areas are the areas we're still plagued with. Um, but looking at how they really worked together and they were so creative. It wasn't just, you know, changing these laws. It was a creative resistance, which I think that has, I guess I, it has surprised me. And it's something that I, I will hold dear to, to my living in this world from here on out. And Jean, I'll just quickly add that you mentioned Maud Coleman, who is one of the hundred names we were very excited about our quest for the history of Maude Coleman, but we discovered in one of the photographs of Maude Coleman, Ephraim Slaughter sitting uh, in that picture. We were like, oh my God, what is Ephraim Slaughter doing with Maude Coleman? We started off thinking of them as silos and we discovered that they were all part of a really integrated in the best sense of that word, community that required solidarity and for self-resilience and self-pride. We discovered that 
Miss Yvonne Hollins, past founder of the uh, Boys and Girls Club of Harrisburg, is a descendant of Maude Coleman. And she organized the Stewardship Fund of the descendants of Maud Coleman, who are helping to um, maintain conservation and preservation of the monument. And those of you who wish to purchase a book, your contribution of the purchase of the book would go into the Maud Coleman Stewardship Fund to preserve the monument. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. Um, I have one more question um, for you all before we turn it over to uh, questions from our uh, from our audience today. Um, and this question concerns the significance and timing um, of this book. Uh, so when you embarked on this work, I'm sure you had little idea what 2020 would bring our way. In what sort of ways has the work found new meaning during the season of a global pandemic and the ongoing protests over our nation's long history of racial injustice. David, would you lead with that? <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I, I mean, there's, there's no question that the, yeah, first thing that happened when we decided to do the book, we were not imagining a, a digital process um, of meeting and collaborating. So that, that just blew our minds. Um, we had to adjust our workflow. Uh, we um, had planned a, a, an event, a big public event in June that students were gonna come to, that descendants were gonna come to, and we were gonna hand them this physical book. And that didn't happen, right? It didn't happen, it wasn't even safe to meet uh, we had a much smaller gathering in, in August and Linwood can talk about that. Uh, but it was, it was supposed to be this big event where we were gonna pass out these books. As we were putting the book together, um, the, the, the cries for racial justice across the country were just so part of our thinking as we researched and carried out the work. Uh, there's a great little introductory essay by, uh, what, by the, the uh, coordinator of the Digital Harrisburg Group and the Commonwealth Monument Group at Messiah, uh, Katie McArdle. And she, she really just, you know, if you download the book or you buy the book, read that essay because it really puts the, the heart on the, the timing of this. You know, and I think we all wanted to do something. We all wanted to, to call attention to the injustices at a local level. And so this book was certainly part of that, uh, that process. I would add that uh, Edward Albee has a quote that says, sometimes you have to go a long distance out of your way to come back a short distance correctly. And we were supposed to be finished long before the pandemic, long before the Black Lives Matter. Uh, but the timing of the project, the timing of the discovery of the, of the uh, descendants, the revelations that we made about people like Maud Coleman, who was fighting for racial justice and racial equity and parity, the number of, of men that Caleb found who were on the city council talking about issues in 1905 and, and 1908 and 1910 that read like the news on the front page of the newspapers today, we found that the project found itself through the relevance. Even the issue that the project was launched in a, uh, in a census year. And we, in a sense, were taking a census of 1870 to, to 1920 as 100 years later in 2020, we were questioning ourselves about how uh, Black Americans are recorded in the census. And, our, our motto became, if Black Lives Matter, then the history of Black Lives Matter also. And by using that history of 1870 to 1920, we could see imprinted like a, a blueprint, the, the struggles that we're, that we're facing today. There's no, no doubt that we, we, we approached it uh, romantically, the anniversaries of the the, the two amendments uh, that fell in a election year, but the project 
the families, the monument, and the book became more and more poignant as we negotiated and navigated through the national election in this year. So the consequences of the monument uh, uh, grew and the evidence of the people grew and the book becomes a turnkey for readers today to look backward, to look forward, I think. Um, I, I have a question about Actually, I remember in October finding, you know, when you're looking at, at newspapers.com, you find the article you're looking for, and then you find a lot of other articles around it that if you have ADD like me, you kind of zero in on those. But I remember finding something above someone's funeral in, uh, about the schools finally reopening in, in October um, be, after the Spanish flu, and they'd been closed for six weeks. And I remember thinking, I, I remember saying to David, wouldn't that be just the weirdest thing? Everything shut down? And this was last fall. So I had no idea that I would get to experience that in just a few months. Um, uh, but also, as I experienced that, I, I remember reading, this man was not on the, um, he wasn't on the monument, but he was involved with one of the churches that was well represented and, and how he would visit um, one of the, the military camps close by that was just devastated by the Spanish flu. And he was the only one that would go there to minister to him, to them. And he was an African-American um, minister that was just very deeply involved and risking his life to go minister at Camp Mar is Marsh. I think that's what it's called. Is that what it's called? Caleb, I can't remember. Camp Marsh, it, Marsh Run. Um, anyway. Uh, but the, also then as, you know, the George Floyd protests, I was involved with those in, in the Capitol, at the Capitol here and walking by where the monument now stands. It wasn't, it wasn't installed yet, but uh, I just remember all those names that we had displayed on, at the very same places that were really protesting these. And someone asked about um, William Howard Day on one of the questions. Uh, William Howard Day had so many um, really stunning articles that, that talked about um, how pernicious Uncle Sam's color line was. Nothing more satanic than Uncle Sam's color line. And I just could hear that voice as we were you know, walking around the Capitol and, and so many women that were speaking out against lynching at that time. Um, and here we were all these years later and we're still you know, having to challenge those same systems that have that are that that are not serving Black lives very well. So um, I, it was. I think it was really a, a, a deep moment that we had those people in our heart and got to experience this time. Uh, we saw it differently. Okay. Were there any questions from the chat here that we could look at? Uh, there is a couple. Okay. Let me go back up. I did see one about people relocating. Um, so the question was uh, something about, did people stay in the area after the eighth ward was disbanded or did they move away? And um, I, I imagine some of them did move away, but a lot of the uh, residents of the Eighth Ward stayed in Harrisburg. In fact, a lot of the um, Black community stayed here for long periods of time, uh, my family included. And um, uh, there were some members of my family who were not mentioned, but they lived in the Eighth Ward. Uh, and, and we look at the 100 voices as being like the notable people that we wanted to recognize, but that is just the floor. It's not the ceiling. There, there are many more people that impacted the community that just could not be mentioned. There, there's not enough room in one book. And um, an interesting piece that uh, like when you were making the connections between the past and the present, uh, there was a lot going on back then to suppress the black voices and, uh, and even in terms of where they could live. And so 
the fact that they stayed in the area is a testament to, to them because uh, they were really restricted due to redlining and you know the whole thing that goes on with regard to race. And I know um, Jean and David had some things that they were looking at at Messiah to work on you know, the redlining in this area. And I'm excited to see where you end up going with that. <laughs> but, um, you know, we do know that uh, Verbeck Town, which uh, is kind of where the uh, Harrisburg Market is now, the, the Broad Street Market, uh, ended up being an area that was constructed for, um, you know, modest rent, where a lot of that blacks ended up moving to that area of town, including my family. So Caleb, I don't know if you wanna say any more about that or not, but I know you and I have talked about that quite a bit, the Calder Street area and what's around there. Uh, Mr. Caleb? Hello, I'm trying to, am I in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're hello. <laughs> yes, you're, yes, you're correct. Quite a few of them moved to what, what, what we call Burbank Town and that particular area, which is most of the old six ward. But also some moved to Edgemont. Mm -hmm. uh, the Edgemont started around 1907 and Edgemont was the name of the company that sold the land. Uh, there was a farm that was uh, broken up into lots and Edgemont was the name of the company that sold lots. So once people in the Eighth Ward knew that they were going to be uh, toward, demolished in the next few years, a lot of them started moving out to the Edgemont and started the Edgemont community, which is still flourishing. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of them moved up into the old Seventh Ward. They basically moved, uh, you might say, four, four or five squares north of the Eighth Ward into the uh, Seventh Ward. And I wanted to add very quickly that when the neighborhood uh, was demolished, eminent domain, they simply didn't tear down the houses. First, they were auctioned off and the buyer had to move them to a different site. They sold everything. They took the houses apart and sold the wood, the nails, the uh, uh, cobblestones, the cornerstones, the ballasts. So that is why today not a single stone or cornerstone or ballast or foundation of the eighth ward uh, remains because it was all turned into recyclable uh, cash product auctioned and sold and moved away. So perhaps you can find evidence and elements of the old eighth ward buildings in the constructions of buildings across the city. Uh, can I just add uh, just two little things to this uh, conversation? Uh, one is that um, uh, I posted a link to uh, a list of publications. There's a recent Pennsylvania history special issue about Harrisburg City Beautiful Movement. And two articles in that special issue deal with this question. One of them by Albert Sarvis is about population migration as a whole. And what Albert shows through GIS analysis, he's looking at black heads of households uh, over time. And he shows that um, for the most part, the the population mirrors the white population, the black population mirrors the white population at the beginning of the 20th century. But when the disruption and the demolition of the older part of the eighth ward happened in the 19 teens, it completely changes the trajectory of the population, as you might expect. And so that the arrow is going straight north, whereas the white population is marching to the northeast out of um, the, the city's core. Um, and then Rachel Williams in that same issue, and this article can be downloaded for free at, at that website, she traces 100 families um, out of the old eight. And some of them are uh, black families, some of them are uh, Jewish families, uh, other immigrant groups. And she's able to show that most of them go straight, you know, most of them go straight north, although they, they do go everywhere. But the, the greatest <coughs> concentrations are directly to the north. And they, and they especially concentrate, as, as Caleb was saying, in the um, southern part of the seventh ward and or the northern part of the eighth ward because there's still two blocks left between North and Forster. And that, that neighborhood, that neighborhood got taken over for a second 
uh, a second claim of, of the state, and they uh, had to move out in the 1950s. And we have some interesting documents uh, about that. And uh, it, it, there's, a, there's an untold story there to the kinds of questions that Sharon was mentioning earlier about racial redlining. And David, one really interesting uh, find that you and Caleb in the history of Texas found is a letter from Maud Coleman about the street that she lives on and how important it is since they have been replaced, it's going to, it, they're going to be moved again. And in this letter, she is writing, uh, asking, please do not relocate us and, and dismantle us a third time. It's a, it's a very compelling letter from a woman who had achieved a great deal for civil rights, equity, and justice. And it also worked very hard to establish the Black YMCAs, and the, uh, which is the parent of our current Harrisburg YMCA, Lancaster YMCA, York, YWCA, I mean, sorry, YWCA. But she writes really eloquently, you know, petitioning, <laughs> please don't move more. us again. I have a few more questions. I'm going to move on. Yeah. Um, could you say something about fellow O.B. Williams Howard Day in regards to Oberlin College? Yes, William Howard Day was a student of Oberlin College uh, and he studied, uh, he was a student under John Brown when John Brown taught at Oberlin College. Um, William Howard Day was an eloquent speaker uh, uh, and uh, uh, an abolitionist in Philadelphia. Uh, he spoke as the keynote speaker of the Grand Review in 1865 in Harrisburg, the first black superintendent of public schools. There is a William Howard Day Fellowship by the Pennsylvania School Board Association that is given every year. Uh, his name is on a housing project, a uh, cemetery. Uh, uh, he is the best known unknown person in, in Harrisburg. We hope to restore his, uh, his uh, illuminate and illuminate his impact on Harrisburg. And going with that, somebody said, I noticed in the book, not many burial locations have been noted. Was that information not available or omitted for a reason? Um, so David is gonna answer. If you look at the, the, the pedestal at the monument and at the book, you see the years these are not the birth and death years of the person. These are the years that they made an impact on the old eighth ward. And that's a question we get all the time. These years don't make sense. This person would have been 11 years old. So we, were, we were looking at the impact of their lives on the old eighth ward and the history between 1870 and 1920. So we focus mostly on the activity and the placemaking and the identity of the, uh, not where they ended up, where they landed up, uh, or where they are buried. David, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, um, it, whenever we found a, a burial place, we recorded it uh, next to death date in the, the fine print at the bottom. So the fine print of each page contains the biographical details about the person. And uh, so if we found a cemetery recorded, we noted it there. Uh, but the, the, this research is really incomplete. I just wanna say that um, we, we published this book with the hope that uh, you all, that Harrisburg residents, people who have an interest in this would help us fill in the picture, uh, would, would write their stories, create Wikipedia pages, for example, for these people, uh, tell their stories in a biographical form. And so this is just the starting point. And so if you have information, we're, we're glad to, to take it. We're glad to issue a second edition if we find out that, uh, you know, that we've got some details wrong too. So I'm a Trekkie. So if, if there, any of you are Trekkies out there, you know what the holodeck is. So the, the book is designed along with the monument to kind of be a, a GPS of the neighborhood in a certain time of vitality. It's to, create a kind of hologram so you can imagine 
how vital life was there. It's not a biography of their lives or an anthology of their achievements, but a, it's a beam me down Scotty kind of moment to 1870 to 1920 so that you can see how vital the community was and how uh, involved, as Jean said, these hundred were in each other's lives. You can hold them up like a crystal and you can see the almost 1100 other people as Sharon said. Uh, so it's a lens, not an anthology. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. We're almost at the one o'clock hour. Um, I want to thank all of our guests, um, uh, starting with um, Mr. Jackson. Thank you so much thank for you. taking the time to talk to us. Um, Lenwood Sloan, it was an honor to, to meet you virtually. I've seen you on the news, but it was exciting to interact with you. Um, and Dr. Williams, who is um, does so much work with genealogy in the Harrisburg area for the African American community. Um, Dr. Corey and Dr. Pettigrew from Messiah College. We really appreciate you taking the time out to meet with our guests today. Um, everybody, please check out the um, memorial, which is on Walnut and Commonwealth Street. It's beautiful. Um, the artwork is amazing. Um, and the book, 100 Voices, you can get it at your local bookstores or please check out the digital copy um, if you click on the links that David added in the chat. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thanks, David.